You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or on? Android device. <laughs> now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the BH Photography Podcast. Uh, before we start up today, uh, we have a special request. We're going to be doing a show in a couple of weeks, Cameras of the Year for 2016. And we are very interested to hear what our listeners have to say about it. So if you have a particular camera that really got you going, Drop us a line, email us at podcast at bhphoto.com and write camera of the year on the subject. Let us know what it is and we will add it into our show. So get cracking on that. Is that and a promise? Hold on, that's but, a promise. <laughs> but also use Twitter, you know, with the uh, hashtag bhphotopodcast. Okay. And uh, remember cameras from 2016. That's the mm-hmm. idea. Not, uh, not your favorite camera from three, four years ago. No, I said 2000. No, right? I know, but yeah. I just want to remind our listeners. I think we should throw uh, all of this into the podcast. We, we are. <laughs> <laughs> As Jason says, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but some cameras that have been announced aren't available yet, so they may not be your favorite camera, but it may be the camera that you're most excited about getting. So include that too. Okay. So should I say that? Well, you said it. It's been said. It's been said. So here we are. Uh <laughs> So now we've been talking about cameras of the year 2016. We're going to talk about today's show. We're going to talk about the basics. Some people know how to use cameras. Some people, their idea of taking a picture is turning on their phone, hitting the camera icon, and then they took a picture. Today we want to talk about what actually goes into taking a photograph. What are the very basics of photography? Uh, John and I are being joined today by Todd Vorenkamp, who has become a regular here. And he's going to help us talk about uh, all of these different entities that go into taking a picture. Let's start off by talking about the basics. What is a photograph? What is a camera? And, and, and how do they all come together? <laughs> no, we're not. That's pretty basic. That's yeah. pretty basic. <laughs> Start that one over. Cut that line. No, it's good. A camera is a box. It's a with box a hole. with a hole in it. Okay. And light comes in. And, and, and so there are three things, really four things that go into it. You have light. That's what makes up an image. You have the exposure time, how long a shutter is open. We'll talk about shutter. You have the aperture of the lens, how much light is coming in, and the sensitivity of the, either the sensor or the film that you're using. So those are the four things that go into creating what we would call a photograph, composition aside. So the basics, light. You have available light. There's room. Uh, there's light in your room. There's light outside. There's electronic flash. There's all sorts of lights. So light has a constant to it. It has a certain volume to it, a certain value. One thing just to, uh, on that subject is people sometimes think that what they see is what their camera sees. The light, available light and what a camera can see are pretty different. I mean, our eyes can see a lot better than what your camera is going to be able to see. That's I mean, true. Very good point. The a, you know, the A7 series. But uh, mm-hmm. in general, people will take a picture of something that they can see, like Todd across the room in this relatively dim studio, and think they'll get a photo like they see, but they're not going to. It's going to either be blurred or shadowy or noisy, something to consider. That's right. But, it's, would, but it will be Todd. Yeah. I Maybe. Or <laughs> the likeness of... <laughs> I, one thing I want to say is you you mentioned the people that whose idea of photography is taking out their phone and taking a picture. And that's all you really need to know is how to push the shutter button and take the picture. All this stuff, all the things that we're going to discuss today are extra information bonus because great photographs can be taken by anybody who knows how to turn on in a camera and then take a picture with it. Mm. Yeah, no, I, Totally. No, no, I get, I, get what you, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying because it's really true. I mean, right. taking a photo, it's like how many people get into their car and drive every day and have no clue as to what's going on under the hood? Right. And you don't have to. Very many. You turn the key. As long as you understand the whole concept of brakes and steering right. and what's going on in front of you, you're okay. Yeah. Well, there you are. You're, you're understanding brakes and steering. That's two things. So Okay. And then you have light because without light, you can't see where you're going. <laughs> And, no, absolutely. Taking it a step further, you know, to understand some of these basic concepts will make your phot- photography better. Sure. And you'll be consistently making good photos. So, yeah, of course, you know, anybody can make a good photo. We, we get that. That's right. been well established in the yeah, past sure. 10 years. But let's take it to the next level. No, and the thing I would follow up is knowing what we're going to talk about today, knowing the, thing, the topics we're going to touch on, learning that information will make you a better photographer. Just having the, the understanding of yeah. it. 
One thing I just that came to my mind is that when talking about the uh, the three basic elements of you know exposure of, of the opening of the lens, the shutter speed, and the sensitivity of the sensor and the amount of light you have, it's very similar to what goes into creating a good composition. It's about balance, and one of the things that if the light changes, your aperture changes and or your shutter speed, if you change your aperture, the lens opening, it affects everything else as well. I think that's kind of one of the hardest things to for people to grasp too is that there are separate functions, but they all work together. And when you juggle one, you got to juggle the other. And that's mm -hmm. the balance you're referring to. And uh, it can be a bit confusing, you know. But let's start with aperture. Let's let's get kind of into it. Okay, aperture, lens opening. That is, the, a lens has a diameter. There's so much, just X amount of light that could fit through a lens. Some lenses are what they call faster. They have wider openings. I, the, be the best way I always have of, of illustrating what a... Uh, a lens aperture is and a shutter speed, the best illustration is, is, is a faucet. If you turn on a water faucet with a little bit of a trickle, it takes a long time to fill the cup with water. Open up that faucet to a wider aperture, and that's what it is inside a faucet, is an aperture, an opening. That water comes out in greater volume, therefore it takes less time to fill that cup. The full cup is your exposure. So again, trickle, long exposure. Blast of water, short exposure. Yeah. Same thing with the camera. Well, just think of the your, the pupil of your eye. I mean, everyone knows when the lights go down, your eye pupil opens up. That's mm -hmm. that's the aperture. That's exactly what that yeah. is. That's opening yeah. up. Yeah. So we need to know how to control that and set it accordingly for the light that is available. By the way, here's a little factoid. The maximum aperture of the human eye is approximately f2.1 in a healthy human eye. Yeah, interesting. Wow. Didn't know that. Can mm -hmm. I upgrade to 1.2 or... Yeah, there are, there are drops that do that, actually. The, the yes. Noctilux for your eye. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, but the idea with aperture gets confusing with people when they see these F numbers. Yes. So do it's me, a, fra it's do a me fraction, an really. There. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of people get confused. They say you open up the lens, close down the lens, smaller apertures. Stop down. Stop down. What does all that mean? I think the easiest way to remember what is a wider or faster aperture and a smaller? Think of f-stops as, fra as fractions. That's it. Uh, f4 is bigger than f8. A quarter, of a, a quarter is larger than an eighth of it. So just think of them in terms of fractions, and then you can suddenly make sense. It falls into place. If you go wider aperture, it means bigger fraction. Unless but, you're horrible at math. But right. I just <laughs> said the, the, the smaller the number, the wider the aperture. Exactly. And it's a ratio between the maximum diameter of the lens and the opening of the aperture diaphragm. See, you just lost me. Right. I got Did confused. I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, what, like you said, the smaller the F number, <laughs> the wider the aperture, which means the more light is coming in. Right. The idea is the brighter it is, the smaller the aperture. Right. Now, to get a proper exposure. Now, by the way, there's something you have to keep in mind. Okay, so you have all these f-stops and all these shutter speeds, and there are various combinations of these that will work out to a good exposure, a good picture. But then you have to think about how long can I hold this camera still? And that's where your shutter speed comes into the picture, right. uh, figuratively and literally. Um, you cannot handle, it's hard to hand hold the camera at a half a second. Define shutter speed a little bit for people. So shutter that speed, okay, that's easy. That's how long the shutter is open to establish the exposure. And uh, most cameras have little blades or curtains that open and close, literally like a window shade. It goes opens, it closes for X amount of time. And the longer it's open, the longer the exposure, the shorter, the shorter the exposure. And depending on your shutter speed, that will determine the size of your aperture, how wide open or stop down your lens is. One of the amazing things about digital cameras, especially like on your phone and stuff, there's no shutter actually. It's just the sensor turns on and off in, in, a, a, in a preset amount of time. An electronic so, shutter. Right. Yeah. But we're, yeah, but for the sake of this conversation. We're, oh, uh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> so the longer the shutter is open, the more light you're letting in. Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea. And again, kind of like with what we were talking about before with eyes and light, you know, the camera is letting in a lot more light at a lot less time. We think, you know, that one twentieth of a second is very short time, but in photo in photography, not, it isn't really actually. No, one twentieth of a second lets a lot of light in, mm -hmm. and it also people move. You'll get blur at that. Stage. Well, that's another thing. The, the, any that's movement the that's going on is in here is also again photographing something standing still at a quarter of a second. You can get a sharp picture of it. A car driving by at a quarter of a second is not going to be sharp. So yeah. it, there's a lot of little variables yeah. in there. 
So we have aperture, we have shutter, shutter speed. speed. Two different elements of controlling the amount of light that gets into your sensor or your film. Now, speaking of film, film has a set ISO or speeding or sensitivity, sensitivity to it. To sensitivity light. is the word. And some films take more light to create an image and some are have more sensitivity to it, so it takes less time. Digital sensors are a different deal. They have a base ISO, a native ISO, which is usually around 100 or so, which would be considered a fine grain film. And then you can tweak it. Uh, it used to be you could take it up three or four stops. Now you could take it up like 10 stops and still hold image quality. So that's another variable where you could have a, a, a set aperture and a set shutter speed, but still control your exposure by changing your and ISO. explain how you use the phrase stop there. Or the word stop. You can take ISO up stops. Can okay, a stop is, good question, John. It's usually used for determining a lens. You have uh, f-stops, and that's where the word stop comes in. One f-stop, the difference between uh, uh, if you open up one stop or close down one stop, that is having or doubling the amount of light coming in. So it's the same thing as changing your shutter speed, going one speed faster, one speed slower. That's also called a stop faster or stop slower. So we use the word stop as a... Yeah. yeah. Also, but, some people use exposure value or EV as well. Right. So Usually stop. people older than me do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm I telling from trust me. I, was, I was right on the cusp of that one. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, stop really comes from, from the aperture, from F-stop. Yes. And yeah. we apply that to shutter speed or ISO or even in some right. cases uh, when we're talking about image, um, stabilization. image stabilization or something. It's just become a generic phrase for one... Really, you can almost say one step up, you know what I mean? One yeah. going up to the next or down to the next level of light you're letting in. So go ahead with ISO. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> but anyway, so you'll hear so the phrase ISO stop is it, by a the way, lot, yeah. but it basically means the next setting up or down. By the way, ISO comes from International Standards Organization, which is an international group that establishes a lot of standards for a lot of different things, including what is white. Now, I can't swear to this because I heard this or read about it. And I know I heard about it or read about it because the internet wasn't around when I heard or read about it. But supposedly there is a tile, a ceramic tile in Washington, D.C., and there's another one somewhere in Europe, I believe in England, that is considered the standard white. It's kept in total darkness in a cool place. And the only time it's measurable is sometime like mid-June at noon when the sun is at its highest and it can be measured on a bright sunny day. So this organization wow. established the, the the numbers that correspond with the sensitivity exactly. prior in the film world and now in the digital world. And in the film world, we used to call it ASA, right. because that which was is American, American standard. Right. Now they, they folded that, just put it into, and, and the numbers are the same. Right. And ISO 100, ASA 100, it's the same thing at all. So that, that depending, it, it's your it's a wash. So the higher your ISO goes, the, the more, more sensitive, sensitive it is to light. To light. And, and the shorter your exposure can be or the more you can stop down you your can, lens. I'm gonna, with, uh, yeah, I'm going to jump in. Everybody uses sensitivity, and that's completely fine. But one person is, that I know of was going to email the podcast and say, when you're talking about digital ISO, it's not sensitivity. It's actually uh, amplitude electronically. So it's like turning up the gain on a microphone or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's... Will you? We'll go back to sensitivity, but for that one guy that's about to send hit send on the email, <laughs> right. I, we understand its amplitude. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually a good point too, yeah. and yeah. It's something you should be noticed that, uh, noted is that uh, it's uh, upping the sensitivity of your sensor or pushing your film is what they call it when you take say an, an ISO. 100 film and rated it 400 or higher than that. That's called pushing, and when you do that you do have a certain amount of loss. You lose a little bit of your highlight detail, shadow detail, um, contrast goes off. You can, with today's cameras, you can, digital cameras, you can push the ISO many stops, three or four stops before you start seeing noticeable degradation of image. But there is a degradation that goes on. The question is, how much can you overlook? Because sometimes you have to degrade the image in order to get the image. Absolutely. Right. That's a, a good fine way to grain say. image of a blurry handshaked picture is useless to you. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'd rather have a little bit of grain and contrast knowing that the picture is well, that sharp. De that degradation that you're referring to is generally called noise. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you turn your ISO up, it's in order to capture images in, in a darker environment. You want to be able to up the sensitivity in order to produce an image 
in darkness that you otherwise might not be able to do. And yes, you will lose some quality in your image, but you will capture the image. Mm -hmm. That's the general yeah. idea. It's a trade-off, yeah. like everything, right? Right. All right. So we have the three. We have aperture. We have shutter Shire. speed. <laughs> and we have ISO. So now in the digital world, ISO is incorporated and in in, is used much more fluidly, mm -hmm. the right word, or used yeah. much more regularly to adjust yeah. your exposure in a way that in the film era, it wouldn't have been because you had right. your film, it was the ISO, you couldn't change it until you changed your film, but you, of course, would adjust your exposure and your shutter speed. I think that like the two biggest benefits of digital, one is the ability to review your images right after you capture them, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. allows you to make alterations or change things or realize that you hit it or you missed it. The other is variable ISO. No longer do you have to take out your roll of Kodak 200 and put in a roll of Kodak 800 or, you know, you have that flexibility that film never, ever had. By the way, I have, back in the film day, I was once on an assignment in the middle of nowhere. I was up in the Appalachians shooting. And I was routinely checking my gear before heading out, and I, I found out that the lens I was using at the time was jammed at f3.5, and I couldn't stop it down. And I had Kodachrome 64, which is what I was shooting with at the time. And it was cloudy out, and I had Nikon F3's top speed of f2000. It worked out that my exposure was f3.5 at a 2000. I was able to keep shooting. Later that day, the sun came out. I got in my car and I ran into three towns within 30 miles and I found several rolls of Kodachrome 25, which was enough to finish shooting as the sun was out. And then when the sun went, got cla I put 64 back in and I basically shot the whole job maximum aperture by just changing my films back and mm. forth. Digital is a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Let's kind of put this all together for our listeners, because remember, this is, you know, kind of supposed to be one-on-one and we've <laughs> gone down different trails. But <laughs> Into the Appalachians. <laughs> so if you, yeah, into the Appalachians. So <laughs> if you're setting your camera to take a picture and you're doing all the manual settings or, and as we'll talk later, you can do some of the manual settings and the camera can take care of the rest, but you'll set your exposure first. Yes. Or you'll set your ISO first. What will you do first? ISO? ISO first, yeah. Get okay. your sensitivity for the darkness, for indoors. If you're doing indoors, bright, you want to bump cloudy. it up real high. If you're out in the sun, there's no reason to shoot at ISO 1000 if the sun is shining. Yeah. There's just no right. real reason to do yeah. so. Turn it down. You'll get crisper, better saturated images. Another thing about shooting at, say, a, a moderate ISO is that it gives you a choice of apertures. Mm -hmm. Because if you put it too high or too low, you kind of limit how fast or how slow you can keep the shutter. Whereas if you keep it at a moderate, like 100 on a sunny day, you could shoot it with the lens stopped down all the way and still handhold it. You could also open it up a good deal and get higher speeds. So you set your ISO, and then you're going to set your exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if it's uh, it's a very bright day, you're going to set it. The number is going to be higher. It's going to be a higher F number. F16, the sunny 16 rule, mm -hmm. used to be something that was a standard. Uh, but you can even go higher or lower. But that's something you'll determine as you go. And then, of course, you'll also shut your, your set your shutter speed. Again, very fast shutter speed if it's very bright or a slower shutter speed if it's not so bright or if you're indoors. And this is when you have to start to be careful because the lower the shutter speed is, that's when you start to see the blur mm -hmm. right? because someone moves. It's either movement inside the frame or movement caused by you moving the camera while the camera's taking and That's exposure. a good point because we don't realize, we think we're very steady with our hands, but... Oh, you know, no, even just your up. heart beating, you pick right. that up. The wind blowing, breathing. hitting the front of your lens with a lens shade on it creates a little so, bit of a buffeting. I mean, everyone's different, but for me, you know, I think I can keep a camera stable at about 130th. That's uh, it. You, you got to qualify that now. We, we, yeah. we, have to, we should come back to this okay. one because we'll it depends on one. the focal length of the lens. Sure, absolutely. But you did mention something I think that, that's really important because uh, if anybody is totally stuck saying, what are these people talking about? You mentioned the Sunny 16 rule. And that is a, a, a very simple breakdown of what exposure is. And it's also a light meter you can carry around in your head. And the sunny 16 rule is very simple. It says that on a bright sunny day, if you set your lens to F16 and the shutter speed. Your camera in this case. The camera. You set the aperture through your the camera. Aperture, yeah, if you yeah. set the aperture of your lens to F16 and the shutter speed of your camera to a shutter speed that corresponds to the sensitivity of your film or ISO, which means if you're shooting at ISO 100, your shutter speed should be 100. 
you will have a perfectly exposed picture. If it gets a little cloudy, open up one f-stop or slow down one shutter speed. It gets very overcast, open up two f-stops or slow down two shutter speeds. Or one slow down one shutter speed and open up one stop. You could do variables. Raining, three stops. If you're in the snow, close it down because there's too much light coming in. It's brighter. So if you know this, if you can understand the sunny 16 rule, F16 at shutter speed equal to your ISO, there's your, per, you don't need a, you don't need a meter. You can take really fine pictures. Let me, let me interject the artistic part of this discussion and then we can get back to the tech, but, uh, you got, you've said perfect exposure. You said, uh, I know balance where you're going exposure. with this one. Yeah. <clears throat> there's nothing that says a medium exposure, not over. Um, overexposed or underexposed is perfect. So if you're an artist and you want to have a certain effect, if you want the world to look brighter than it does or darker than it does, feel free to adjust your exposure one way or the other because I, you are the artist. And you great get point. To call and it, there's a difference between the technical correct exposure and aesthetically the best exposure. Right. Some pictures look better dark. Some look pictures look better brighter. And so that's, that's a great point. Really good. And I tend to find when... That's when why you, you brought me. When you set, <laughs> your, um, when you set your camera on an auto setting for the camera to take care of all this, or even on the P setting, which we'll talk about later, I tend to find that it it's, it overexposes to my taste. But we'll get to that later. Anyway, back to aperture briefly, because setting the aperture not only affects the amount of light coming in, it affects the depth of field. And yeah. this is when it starts to get a little bit... Can I, can I jump in? Please do, yes. So we're about to talk about depth of field. There's what I call side effects of the three sides of that exposure triangle. Aperture, shutter speed, ISO. Each one of those sides of the triangle has what I call side effects. Aperture has a side effect of depth of field and optical sharpness. ISO has the side effect of digital grain or digital noise or grain. Mm -hmm. And shutter speed has the um, effect of motion in the frame, movement, or camera shake. Or lack of. Or lack yeah, of. Or yep. freezing it. Those are good exactly. points. And I'm, again, I, this sure. is for all the people that are going to call in. Uh, in addition to, you know, digital noise, as you phrased it, with ISO, there there are other aspects too, you know, right. in terms of the desaturation to some degree of an image. Yeah, those. I mean, those are the, ba those are the, but, the yeah, basic, basic ones. But After but that, we start right. going but, but way. So, <laughs> yeah, but he's absolutely right. And these are the things we're going to talk about when we come back from a break. But... Let's talk briefly about depth of field because to me that's that's pretty important. I think the best example I've ever seen is um, when you look, if you're using a DSLR especially, when you're focusing through the finder, you're looking uh, through the lens at its maximum aperture, its widest aperture, which means it has, which and the wider the aperture, the narrower your depth of field, the narrower the of how much of your image is actually in focus. Can so we, I'm sorry, to, because there's so much in here, but right. for people that may be new to this, when you say how much is in focus, you're, something will be in focus. It's just what is beyond and in front of the exact point of focus exactly. that remains in focus. And I, focus. I think a good example, depth, yeah. depth of focus, and yeah. a good example of that, you're in a park and you're with uh, your loved ones and you take a picture of somebody, a nice head and shoulder portrait, and they look great in the viewfinder. You see them, they're nice and sharp, and everything else is out of focus. And you get the picture back and you have trees and limbs coming out of their heads and people riding bikes on their shoulders because... You're, you're looking through the lens at, say, f2 or 2.8 or 3.5 or 4 or whatever it is. But when you're shooting, you might have it stopped down to 11 or 16. And when you stop down to smaller apertures, more comes into focus. And you didn't see that. Now, with a mirrorless camera, you will. That's because of the fact that one of the beauties of mirrorless is that when you stop the lens down, you get to actually see the depth of field. That's a benefit to me of, of a mirrorless camera versus a DSLR. So that's something you have to think about. And also, if you do have a DSLR, you can see this in the viewfinder if you press the depth of field preview button, which many cameras have, not all, but many do. But that gives you a chance to pre-visualize how much is going to be in focus in front of and behind your subject. Right. What that button does is it allows the camera's aperture diaphragm to constrict to whatever yeah, uh, it's going to shoot the picture at. Yeah. So, but, so just briefly, the when your aperture is set higher and when i say higher i mean that the f number is higher so let's say f 22 more is going to be in focus yes in the you background have depth in the of foreground focus. you have greater depth of focus in the in the in the background in the foreground and what you're focusing on will be in focus and when you stop 
to f2 or lower or, even, mm -hmm. uh, which is possible on some mm -hmm. lenses. Your point of focus will remain in focus as long as you've established that. But items in the things in the background and things in the foreground are going to be out of focus, and right. and that can create beautiful imagery. It's just oh uh, yeah, just, yeah. I was That's, getting back at your yeah. style, at your taste, what you like. Yeah, and, and yeah. And, and by that, the way, if you, a good example of that, if you're totally confused as what we're talking about, here's a little thing you can do: take a newspaper. All right, and hold it about six inches from your eyes. You cannot read it. Squint, and suddenly the text comes into focus. Right. When you squint, you are stopping down your lens more than it does on its own. Yep. And depth of field is like, that's what people gravitate towards in photography these days, especially portrait photography, because you, you don't really get great. I mean, you can, you can get a shallow depth of field with your iPhone or your phone camera, but it's shooting with a with a larger lens that's opened up, you get a much more shallow depth of field, and that really makes a photo look like it came out of a quote unquote real camera. And that's right. what a lot of people desire. Like, right. well, I mean, if especially with a portrait, right. you want to have the viewer, you want their eye to go to what you want them to go to. And sure. if, for example, everything is blurry in the background, they're going to focus on what is in focus. And right. that's where you want the eye to go. So it's a tool to... Bottom, uh, bottom line is if the eyes are not in focus in a portrait, it's blown. It, it, right. it never looks right at all. Yeah. And you could, as long as one eye is in focus, the portrait works on many levels. 90% of the time it should be the near eye. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. The other 10% are pictures I took <laughs> with the wrong eye in focus. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we're going to come back with more technical doodads to confuse you. <laughs> we hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Just a fast review of the manual settings. Uh, you have the shutter speed, meaning how long the light is allowed to strike the sensor or the film. You have the lens aperture which is the opening of the lens, how much light comes in through the lens or how little light comes in. Then you have the sensitivity of your film uh, or uh, imaging sensor and the ambient light. And, and one affects the other. And Todd, you really summed it up pretty well. Why don't you give us a little summary of the side, the side effects, effects of each and how they play with each other? Sure. So right before the break, we talked about depth of field as a side effect of aperture. The wider the aperture, the bigger the opening in the lens, the shallower your depth of field or your depth of focus. The other side effect for aperture is image sharpness. And a lot of people don't think about this, but when light's passing through the lens it, past the aperture diaphragm, light bends. And I'm not going to get into it too much, but like basically what you need to know is if you want a very sharp photo, don't shoot, don't think like if I stop it down to f22, make a very small hole that I'm in and get maximum depth of field that you're going to get a sharper image. That's correct. Because Good point. A uh, thing called diffraction. Basically, the, mm -hmm. the light going past those aperture blades bends, and the angle of bending is more severe when that hole is smaller. So, so what happens is you have more yeah. in focus, but the right. whole picture entirely is it's, not as sharp yeah. as it could be. Right. So the mid-range apertures, at, you know, if it's an f2.8 lens, if you shoot 5.6 to 11, f5.6, f8, f11, that's going to give you your maximum sharpness. I'll tweak that even more. Yeah. Most lenses are at their sharpest about two and a half to three f stops down from the whatever the widest aperture right. is. Yep. So if you want to have the if you want to get the most resolving power out of your lens, that's what you want to shoot sure. at. But that may not be the best aperture for the photograph. Exactly. It might be too much depth of field or not enough. Right. So there's a trade off again. Yep. There's always compromises. And then uh, so that's those are the side effects of aperture depth of field. Well, also about yep. when you, when the aperture is very wide. Yep. You're going to get softness. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Loss of contrast, yep. which again could be what you want for yep. that picture. The, the goal of many lens companies these days is to make the lens very sharp at wide apertures. But uh, it's difficult to beat physics, so it I doesn't always when work. When you hear you know, camera geeks talk about yeah. the lenses that they love and, and fast lenses, yeah. that's kind of what they're referring to, right? And yeah. A lens that still is very sharp at its right. widest, its maximum yeah. aperture. Like every, yeah. every lens at f8 is pretty good yes. you know, and very sharp. But right. if, you have a, if you have a lens where you can open at f1.4 and you still get a sharp image when that and that very narrow depth of field or depth of focus that's what, that's mm -hmm. the uh, the goal of a lot of optical and engineers the shutter mm -hmm. speed side effects shutter speed side effects um, two of them both involving movement a slower shutter speed if there's any movement in the frame you'll see it in the photo so if a car's driving by 
airplane, a person walking, they might blur if it's a slower shutter speed because the shutter is open. Any movement that occurs is captured by the film. The other one is, and oppositely, you can freeze motion. So a fast shutter speed, you can catch a ball in midair, sharp, freeze the water of a waterfall or you know things like that. Right, those, those shots right. that everybody knows of waterfall where it all looks white right. and, and kind of hazy. Milky. And milky. Creamy. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> that's, Luxurious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all those things. Uh, <laughs> it, the shutter speed is slower. Yeah. And the risk of that is if there's any camera movement, other right. things are going to be blurry. You don't want that. So, of right. course, you need to stabilize your camera on a tripod or otherwise. Right. But uh, when you talk about a, sh a slow shutter speed, let's try to talk numbers because, like I said sure. earlier, you know, we I think of 1 20th of a second is very fast. Right. In general, that is something. I mean, less than a second is very fast. But right. in, in photographic terms, not so much so. No, the ph photography is a capture of a moment in time. And sometimes that moment can be a 32,000th of a second. Sometimes it can be 15 minutes. But generally, when you're shooting handheld, you want to shoot at a shutter speed that's sufficient to keep the shake of your hands and your body from imparting itself onto the image. So Now, there is a way yeah. around that, by the way, and sometimes it can yeah. be used very effectively, and that is just say you're photographing something moving, like a person running right. or a car Panning. or a bike. Pan with the subject. And that right. takes a little bit of practice, but... What you can do is you can get your subject in very good focus. There'll be right. movement going on, but there you can very recognizable yep. and 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 it makes sense. And the background is blurring by, yeah. which could be really effective. There are times you want to shoot that right. way. Right. I think one thing that's cool about photography, or the thing that's cool about photography, is the eye doesn't see blur. The so yeah. the eye never sees a waterfall that's milky. The eye doesn't pan with a car and watch the rest of the world go into streaks of light. Photography does that. And that's why those types of photos get such uh, attention and, you know, reaction, reaction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Cause we yeah. just can't see it that way. Yeah. In yeah. Bo Boca too, when you're talking about shallow depth of field, when out of focus highlights bloom in the background of a, of a movie shot or a photograph, mm -hmm. you're, that's something your eye doesn't mm -hmm. see on its own. It has to, it has to, uh, it's something that's reproduced by a lens either a photographic lens or camera lens, you know, cinema, cinema lens. lens yeah. But it's interesting, it, it actually is the way our eyes see. We just It's just that when you're looking at somebody through your eyes, you can't right. glance over at what's out of focus. As sure. soon as you do, it comes into focus. Yeah, exactly. You can't freeze the focus of your eyes. Um, something I think is really worth mentioning that we're talking about uh, uh, time exposures and shutter speeds and freezing your subject and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's no... There's only one real rule that kind of holds as to how slow you could handhold the camera. And, and the rule that seems to work the best is that you should not handhold the camera at a shutter speed slower than the focal length of your lens. So if you have a right. 50 millimeter lens, don't handhold it under average circumstances slower than 150th. If it's a 500 millimeter lens, 500th. If you're shooting with a 15 millimeter lens, you could theoretically handhold it at a 15th of a second yeah. and maintain, you know, a sharp image. Now, we also have something called image stabilization, which most most cameras now have. And what yeah, that and lenses, lenses and yeah. cameras. And what that really does is it buys you time in a sense. Right. Whereas if uh, many cameras say they'll it gives you a three-stop advantage or a four-stop advantage. Some cameras go up to six and a half stops, which is kind of crazy. That means that rather than being able to handhold it at, uh, uh, say, 125th of a second, if it was a 125 millimeter lens, just to throw This is when Alan there. does math. That's when I'm doing my math. Oh, God, please <laughs> let it work in my head right now. You can now slow down your shutter by about four, you know, three to five stops, depending on what the actual right. situation is, and still get a sharp picture. And that's pretty amazing. Yeah. There was a online. There was a guy with a new Olympus shot, a 15 second handheld shot, mm. and it was sharp. Right. Yes, I'm sure he was doing the Harris. Yeah, you know, by yeah there's always there's everyone has the little tricks and the yeah. techniques to keep things stable. And, and a simple one sometimes is just to take a deep breath. Yeah, you know, and then let it out. Yes, and shoot halfway. It, halfway. Suit, oh, that is such a good there. point. A lot of people, I, I've heard him say, yeah, just take a breath, hold it, and then squeeze. No, no, don't. When you take a deep breath and hold it, you're you're tensing your body and you're amplifying your pulse. Exhale, your body relaxes, your pulse slows down, then squeeze. There's that the one shot. moment, like kind of in the middle of the exhale, for me anyway, where where I feel like, now, 
you know, like yeah. you get it. I've I mean, actually seen that happen to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm sleeping <laughs> at my desk. But uh, get back to uh, shutter speeds and, sure. and in general, throw us a couple examples of uh, shutter speed that will freeze, let's say, a ball in flight uh, or even a, a fleeting facial gesture and then also one that you could use to uh, to use blur to your advantage. Yeah, like, so fast shutter speeds, like if I'm trying to freeze action, I'm going a thousandth of a second or faster. Uh, I think that's, I, there one, might be a rule of thumb. One one thousandth. One one thousandth. You're looking yeah, when you're sorry. seeing on the, uh, um, the camera. Depending on the lighting conditions and what my aperture needs to be, I'll sh shoot as fast as, the fastest the camera can get me, basically. Open up the lens almost all the way. Just set the ISO. I'll probably leave it at the native, but I'll, and then I'll take whatever I, shutter speed I can get from that. So if it's a thousandth, two thousandth, or four thousandth, or whatever, great. On the slow side, star trails start around after 30 seconds. Actually, you basically, as you don't get star trails, you get blurry stars <laughs> exactly. in 30 seconds. Right. You probably want to do four minutes. That's when you start to see a little bit of trail. 16 minutes, you've got to really And you better be trail. on a tripod. Don't, you, yeah. This is but not this, hand this holding. Is yeah, this is advanced <clears throat> yeah. stuff. That's, yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk more about okay. like, like the, the stream, you know, That's, or... With, with, digi or, with digital... With digital lights of a yeah. car, you know, things like it, that. It depends on... Like with a car, you might watch a car go by and figure out how many seconds it's going to be in your frame and then base your decision on that. Um, de totally depends on the composition. For a stream, I I usually vary it and I'll look at the LCD and look at the picture and like there's there can be too milky, I guess, you know, if it just look, if it looks completely it's very fake. subtle. Like yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would play around with it, you know, start just go slower and slower and then especially if you're on a tripod and you have the flexibility to just play around with it and then later on pick which one you like best. But could be one or two seconds or okay so uh, and then the the side effect for iso the side effect for iso is uh back in the days of film you had uh green. more green more right. film green so it looked the image looked greenier mm -hmm. uh and shadows were lost and your highlights blew out yeah picture quality went down on uh on digital iso you have what they call digital noise so you've increased the sensitivity or the amplitude of the sensor and you get more artifact digital artifacts in the in the image Noise. Now, by the way, I think it's also yeah. important to mention that uh, sometimes excessive grain or noise could add to the photograph depending on the picture. It, it sets the mood. It sets right. the tone of it. And sometimes you want that to just get that extra yeah. emotional twist out of it. Film did that organically <clears throat> and mm -hmm. pleasingly. Digital has not yet really mastered yeah, it. Yeah, like it's still gritty and crunchy. Yeah, there's that's something that maybe those – sensor engineers that are listening to this podcast that's uh, pr probably something they're working on is clumps make, of grain are a lot more yeah. pleasing than yeah spots of color yeah yeah, yeah. So. but you also mentioned using the native iso so if if you can keep your iso low yeah generally you're going to have a sharper better saturated image right with yeah. better detail highlights better, and shadow overall yeah. image quality right. will be better well the one thing to remember out of all this is that you have these three factors yep. and you set them individually, but they work together. Right. So if you adjust your exposure through the aperture, you're going to have to look at your, your shutter speed to make sure that's keeping, keeping up with it. And, yep. and if you change your ISO, you change it goes. Every yeah. action yeah. has a reaction. Exactly. Yeah. So let's jump a little bit to talking about the camera itself and, and the settings that we see. You pick up a camera. I have, my, I have a Nikon D600 in my hand. You have your dial on the left and the four basic settings are M, A, S, and P. M for manual, which is what we were just talking about. If you're going to set your settings manually, so you just do, set your, that's hands on. You just did P, A, S, M backwards. Right. Okay. I'm get, <laughs> so really, yeah, it's, it, we, it's kind of referred to as P, A, S, M. And now, now this will differ a bit for other camera brands. Uh, on Canon and Pentax, for example, the modes are abbreviated as P, A, V, T, V, and M. Uh, with the TV standing for time value as opposed to the S on Nikon standing for shutter speed, but it's the same functions. And, uh, and the P as on all of the brands stands for programmed auto. And this is not a full automatic uh, as in a point and shoot, but uh, you set the ISO value on your camera and the camera establishes the exposure values. It says aperture and shutter speed for you. Aperture and shutter speeds for you, yeah. Then you have S, which is shutter priority, so you'll set the shutter speed and the camera will determine the best aperture for you. And then you have A 
And as we are going to yeah, title A this, is not for automatic. A is not it's for automatic. Aperture. Aperture priority. You set the aperture, and then the camera will set what it feels is the the, uh, the most appropriate shutter speed. And uh, a lot of photographers will go back and forth. They'll, they'll do what they do. I mean, some people will never use program. Uh, other people are always auto, always manual. And there's many people who will, will work with aperture priority. I think that might that's be my, the most That's common. my primary from, mode and, aperture you know, from kind of more advanced photographers mm -hmm. will we'll set a lot of things on aperture priority so they can control the depth of field yep and let the camera set the shutter right. speed uh so you have those those four settings and uh each has their own you know their own idiosyncrasies uh alan says he likes to use aperture priority i often shoot with well i'll keep my camera set on program because you never know when you're going to get a shot at the last minute that's the kind of photography i like to do somebody passes in the street boom you want to yeah. get it you don't have time to set your setting, so you shoot it. Uh, I also find that when I set with program, that things overexpose a bit to my taste. Uh, the camera sets it. I think that just every camera is probably different. And with program, you have some uh, some things you can do. There's something called the exposure compensation, where you can nudge up or down your exposure. Most uh, cameras allow you to do that, yeah. no matter what mode you're in. Right. Program is interesting because it is as close as we get to what we call automatic. Yes, you can just push the button and the camera will say, okay, we have this amount of light and we're going to put in this shutter speed so that the picture is sharp and stop it down to match that. Um, but what uh, most program cameras will do, and again, it varies model to model, brand to brand, is that it will vary the exposure, your, your shutter speed aperture combination, depending on what lens you have. Because uh, if you have a 500 millimeter lens on there, the best exposure is not going to be hand holding it at a 60th of a second at f16, which the meter says is perfect. So what a lot of these cameras do is they understand what focal length is. And if it's a longer lens, a more telephoto lens, which has higher magnification, it automatically ups the shutter speed increases the shutter speed to avoid blur and opens up the lens aperture to compensate for that shutter speed. Correspondingly, if you're using a wide angle lens, it'll allow you to shoot at slower shutter speeds and stop down more unless you want to override it. And many cameras will allow you to do that too, usually with a wheel or a dial. If you don't like the combination it came up with, you spin a dial and it gives you alternate combinations of shutter speeds and apertures that give you the same exposure. Right, right. So. Again, there are times where you, there are photographers who want to use the different settings. There are times when you should use each mm -hmm. setting. That's the way I find. So if I'm just if if I'm going to be walking out in the street, I'll have it MP. But if I'm in a room and I'm doing a job and I've established what the general lighting is in that room, then I, I'll switch it to manual or aperture priority. Sometimes right. there are times when you want to set it to, to set it to shutter priority because you know that you can't go lower shutter speed or you're right. going to get blur. Uh, everyone has their kind of different yeah. ways of doing these things. So I don't know, do you guys have any examples of when you would use one or the other? I think the majority of serious shooters shoot aperture priority because they want to control depth of field through the shots or can have the lens at its sharpest point and photograph there. Um, that's, that's mostly what I do, and yeah. that's my reasoning. Yeah. Having said that, there's times where you want to do shutter priority because you need to freeze action or something. Mm-hmm. A good example, um, I used to shoot boats a lot. And yeah. when I was doing offshore powerboat racing stuff, I would routinely set my camera to a high shutter speed right. because I wanted to stop things. Correspondingly, if we were shooting towards sunrise or sunset and the yeah. light was questionable, I would open up my lens all the way an aperture priority mm -hmm. and have the camera Get as just much, keep getting yeah. that shutter speed as, fa as high as it yeah. can based on my maximum yeah. aperture. So depending on the time of day, yeah. I would use aperture or shutter to get the same goal. That's what I, and fading light, I'll open the lens up all the way yeah. and I'll listen to the shutter as mm -hmm. it starts whining. And when I hear a longer shutter speed, then I start to bump up the ISO. Mm -hmm. Lens is open all the way. I'm starting to get motion blur or, sh you know, camera shake. Right. Then I'll bump the ISO up. And that's a good point because that's something in the film era yeah. you could not do. No, but without it, changing digital, a roll lens. Yeah, you have that, you have that third option. And you now know. you also have the ability to put in many cameras the ISO onto auto as well. Mm -hmm. And it will right. also, as the light levels get too low, it'll say, wait, we're losing light here. Yeah. Let's start bumping the sensitivity. Yep. So you actually have an extra option right now to maintain that same goal. Right. I've actually, when I shoot air shows, I shoot, 
aperture priority, which sa- which sounds counterproductive, but I'll be shooting like a 300 f4 lens. I will shoot aperture priority at f4 or f5.6 or at maybe even f8 if it's really bright. Mm-hmm. And then I take the maximum shutter speed that the camera is going to give me to freeze that action. Yeah. So you and, can, and cameras that you go 8,000 of a second yeah. is very doable these days. Yeah. Cause yeah. It, if you, the, the downside, if you shoot that at shutter priority and you dial it up to the 8,000th of a second and you're panning and maybe a cloud comes through the, through the sky or something, you're, you're going to get a really dark shot. Yeah. But if you shoot at aperture priority, you know the camera's going to give you the fastest possible shutter speed for that lighting condition. I liked how you said you listen to the shutter speed because I think a lot of people do that too. And yeah. it, it, you know, it, it's to some degree odd that we're talking about listening to something in here in, yeah. in a visual medium, but it is important to kind of hear if the exposure is too long because you know right. you, from experience that oh, that's going to blur something. Yeah. You know? When, it, when you it goes from, from click to yeah. click, click yeah. then you're like hmm. yeah and that, <laughs> by the way that's an important thing and that is that you know any camera you get the more you use it the more you become accustomed to it you learn it you become sensitive to it right. and yet you can hear these little subtleties going on yeah yeah let's jump real quickly to one subject we didn't talk to talk about which is white balance uh again something that is kind of new to the digital right. arena because you know you would you could by film, you know, based on the, the kind of light that yeah, you're you bought be daylight in. or tungsten, right? right. <laughs> uh, and now you you know, if you go to your your menu, you'll see that the white balance has a kind of a range of possibilities. Uh, you know, fluorescent, fluorescent white, shade, uh, sun. shade, yeah. sun, yeah. open shade, things. cloudy, yeah. sunny. Yeah, so, there's all kinds of stuff. And again, referring to what I said earlier, once you know, if you're in a room or a place where the light's not going to change, you can set it, or you can put it on automatic where the light changes. And I find that that's actually really interesting, really a great, yeah. you know, development because auto white balance is generally pretty good. I mean, yeah. you may not yeah. be, may not be perfect. You'll get some greens here and there. Every but, camera's, di- but right. every camera brand and line and model is, is a little bit different, right. but I find quite often auto white balance works very well, especially when you're working in mixed lighting yeah. where it's almost impossible to Which figure out something. Common. If you're shooting, if you're shooting raw files, auto white balance is a, is a perfect place to be. If you're looking for a certain, look to the image, then I think you can deflect the, the white balance setting towards cool or warmer, well, depending the, on what you could, you know, with a raw file, you yeah. can always readjust can always, that. Yeah. It's all there. That's exactly. what's beautiful about it. The, uh, just so people know white balance is, uh, what white balance is every light source has a certain color temperature and it's mm-hmm. in, it's in Kelvin gets assigned a number. Uh, there's, if you look at a light bulb in your home, it has a warm glow, uh, Xenon or new LED lights have a very cool glow to the eye, which they're actually closer to the daylight, but daylight feels warm to us. So every light source has its own t- temperature. You can adjust the camera to reflect that temperature. And again, By the way, so- an interesting thing that it, it's important to mention with, yeah. is that auto white balance works very, very well under most circumstances. A place where you never want to use it is if you want to capture a sunrise or a sunset. Yeah. Because yeah. what auto white balance does is it, the job of auto is to neutralize the white and gray areas so that right. they don't have a tint. If you want to get that gorgeous gold light of a sunrise or a sunset and you put it into auto white balance, it's going to make it look like noon. Right. So what you want to do is keep it on daylight the sun icon, and it will allow the light to go warmer. You don't, yeah. yeah, so that's the only time I try to avoid what a white balance, sunrise, sunset, because you basically lose the effect you're right. trying for. Or shoot raw and change it after the fact. Or shoot raw and then you could do whatever you want with yeah. it, correct. Yeah, we haven't started talking about raw and, yeah. and, and, and JPEG, but that's maybe another show. Yeah. However, uh, with white balance, one thing to remember, I think Alan summed it up pretty well. Usually you can leave it on auto and be comfortable, but there are a range of settings. And even once you get into right. it, then you can adjust, you know, you can go to... You can dial in a specific you can color. Dial in, yeah, yeah, exactly, right to the exact number that you and want. And by the way, it's another nice thing about mirrorless cameras is that when you come into exposure compensation and white balance compensation, you see it happening in the finder. Right. right. Yeah. And that to me is so... That's yeah. why I switched to mirrorless cameras. Yeah. Right. One that's of the key that. reasons. Let me get, let me go on that soapbox that I mentioned before, but... We we talk about oh how you should how should you set your white balance, what mode should you use stuff like that. I think and you'll if you spend time online in the photography world you'll see all these things like oh you need to shoot manual you have to do that if you don't shoot manual you're not a real photographer or you're you know things like that. I think the people that say that are giving the the vast majority of the world's photographers a huge disservice. Like there is nothing wrong with shooting your camera on program auto. And concentrating on the composition or enjoying the moment mm-hmm. instead of worrying about where what 
position my dials are in or what setting this is at or what where my white balance is, you know, like enjoy the moment, be there, leave the camera on auto. If you're getting the photographs that you want to get and the camera's doing it all for you, that's totally acceptable. If Agreed. you're if you're messing around on manual mode and you're missing stuff, you know, that's that's not fun for a photographer. Like, oh, I could have gotten this great shot, but I was on manual mode and I hadn't dialed my ISO or, you know, it's like just put it on auto and shoot it. Let the camera do the work. There's very sophisticated computers inside these cameras that very smart Why people. Why are we doing this episode then, dude? I'd, because, <laughs> this whole well, here, I can get to that. So <laughs> here's the thing. Like if you're shooting on program auto <clears throat> and you're not getting the photograph you want because you want a shallower depth of field or you want blur from the car passing, or something, that's when you change stuff. And once you, when you listen to this podcast and you understand all that stuff, you can go out in the world and start doing that. But until then, don't be scared to shoot auto. I totally because you know, and don't listen to the guy that says you have to shoot manual. Auto, and we go back to the car analogy. Automatic transmissions have been around forever. They're actually way more prevalent than standard transmissions. Nobody ever can say, "Oh, you're not a real driver because you're driving an automatic." This is something that's really worth uh, mentioning: is that if if you have a new camera and or you're new to photography, one of the beauties of digital is that unlike film, it does not really cost anything to go out and play and experiment. Um, one thing you don't want to do is really have to experiment when something really special is happening. Go out right. when there's nothing doing, take pictures of all kinds of crazy things, play with the settings, S see what they do, yeah. take note, make mental notes, or write them down if you have to, if that's your style, so that when you do go out on a real photo outing or it's to shoot an event, you don't have to sweat these details because you already did. And, and the one and, thing, you know, the one it's thing nice. that is great about, well, I agree 100% with what you guys are saying, but when you're going back to look at the images that you take, before, you know, we also have to take notes, you know, what did I right. shoot that in? You know, yeah. what was the f-stop? <laughs> now it's all there for you. That's I mean, right. All, metadata you is there. That's all right. the metadata is right there. So you can see, oh, yeah. that's what an f, that's what the, the f-step change did, or oh, that's right. what the ISO change yep. did. And it's right there. You can just thumb through it so quickly. It logs it for you. Well, we are obviously not going to cover everything you need to know to get started in photography in one episode. So I think we're going to come back for photo 101.2 in the near future, talk about lenses and other camera functions. In the meantime, reach out to us about Cameras of the Year 2016. We want to know what you think is the best, most exciting camera of 2016. You can tweet your response to us at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast or email us at podcast at bhphoto.com. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Todd. And as always, thank you, our listeners, for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs>